The outbreak of the Spanish Civil War had an incredibly divisive effect on Irish society and many people were swayed by papal denunciation and media reports of attacks on the clergy, civilians and churches in Spain. Atrocities were carried out by both sides in that conflict but media coverage in Ireland focused almost entirely on the Republican side and not the fascists. The Republican Congress and others on the left were alarmed about a level of support shown for Owen O'Duffy and the blue shirts here in Ireland. And when O'Duffy and his men travelled to Spain to fight, they were adamant that the blue shirts would not be the only representation of Irish public opinion on Spanish battlefields. Ireland's wild geese have historically fought in many conflicts on many continents. There is a folklore and mythology around the Spanish Civil War that is almost unrivaled. Ballads and monuments today give a very, very different impression from the reality of public opinion in 1930s Ireland. The Republican Congress and others on the left organised public meetings in support of the Spanish Republic here in Dublin, some of which occurred here on York Street, but those meetings encountered fierce opposition. One Garda intelligence source felt compelled to say in 1936 that the streets of Dublin were now totally unsafe for the radical left. Some important figures in the Republican Congress are among the very first people reporting on the changing political climate in Spain. Padre O'Donnell published a book, Salud, an Irishman in Spain in 1937, a book that was designed to counter some of the anti-Republican hysteria in the Irish press. O'Donnell found himself entangled in the situation almost totally by accident. He had gone to Spain to attend the People's Olympiad in Barcelona, an alternative to the Olympic Games which are being held in Nazi Germany. The Games in Barcelona, needless to say, never went ahead. Those who wanted to fight fascism had every opportunity in the Spanish War, mm. where, and the Republican Congress, of course, played a, a very important part in helping to mobilise forces who would actually go to fight in Spain and it was one of the big organising forces to give political support mm. at a time when the Catholic Church was leading a huge campaign of reaction and distortion as to what was actually happening in Spain. Mm. You know, with these lurid headlines about nuns being raped and burnt and, mm. and all the rest of it. Whereas the, the sort of uh, crushing of the Catholic priests in the Basque country by Franco's forces uh, never merited any discussion at all. So mm. the Republican Congress uh, was one of those things which was actually organising the fight against mm -hmm. fascism in ways which the uh, Irish Times certainly don't want to refer to. One of the noticeable things, if you look at the um, special branch reports that followed the Republican Congress from 1934 up until I think 1938 or possibly under 1939, the files are hugely thick when it's in 1934, 35, 36, and they become thinner and thinner as the Republican Congress activity becomes less and less in sort of 1936 onwards. Um, but what you can see in those reports is that in 1934-35 there are huge crowds of people turning out um, for usually meetings in and around Calabria Street um, to hear people like Patrick O'Donnell speak and they're hugely supportive and uh, the vast majority of the people that are attending those meetings are supporting the speakers, are cheering the speakers on. Around about 1937-38 it becomes noticeable to those reporting on the meetings that the vast majority of the crowd are now hostile to the speakers. 1936 was the 20th anniversary of the Easter Rising and the city witnessed some of the largest commemorations of that event it had yet seen. Sadly, however, the city also witnessed the worst anti-communist and anti-socialist violence it had seen since the destruction of Connolly House in 1933. A large contingent from the Republican Congress and the Communist Party of Ireland made the decision to march in the annual IRA Easter commemoration in that year. A commemoration that traditionally came here to Glasnevin Cemetery on the north side of the city. They wore Easter lilies with red tabs upon them to symbolise both their republicanism and their socialism. And among those who marched was Willie Gallagher, a member of the Westminster Parliament in London, a Communist Party member of that parliament from Scotland. A mob attacked this contingent on many occasions. Over 200 people threw stones at the General Post Office on O'Connell Street and attacked them all the way here to Glasnevin. 
Among those who suffered was Roddy Connolly, son of the executed James Connolly. He was split open by a rock thrown at the GPO. At Glasnevin, the attacks continued even inside of the cemetery. One member of the mob shouted that the godless bastard should not be allowed to set foot on Catholic soil. Little did he know that this is a non-denominational cemetery. The mob were after any and all Reds they could get their hands on, but in particular, Captain Jack White, a founding member of the Irish Citizen Army in 1913. Jack White was struck with a railing that was ripped off a grave here inside of Glasnevin. He recalled later that last Easter Sunday, we had to fight for three kilometers against the mob as we tried to commemorate the Republican heroes of Easter week. He referred to them as pious hooligans who ripped the railings off of the graves. On the day following the scenes of violence in Glasnevin Cemetery, a meeting was to be held here at College Green. Padder O'Donnell and Willie Gallagher, a visiting Scottish Communist MP, were to be the speakers. Gardy estimated that 98% of the people who showed up at College Green were hostile to the aims of that meeting, an astonishing figure. Ever determined, Padder O'Donnell attempts to address the crowd by climbing a streetlight, but he's met by a barrage of objects, including potatoes with razor blades embedded within them. It was once again dangerous for socialists, communists and left republicans to fly the red flag in Dublin. And it really intensifies um, during the war in Spain, where any attempt really to argue the case for the Spanish Republic could be physically threatened or attacked. Um, and that's driven again by hostility from the Catholic Church, hostility from much of the press, particularly the Irish independent newspapers. Um, it's facilitated by Parties like Fine Gael, who continually play as well the anti-communist card and, and who are you know, very vociferously pro-Franco during the summer of 1936. The involvement of General Ono Duffy and the blue shirts in General Franco's fascist coup in Spain certainly reinvigorated Congress and the broader left in Dublin. The Republican Congress newspaper poured scorn on those who enlisted in the blue shirts and there were fierce physical confrontations between the two factions. The Communist Party noted that of the men who were joining O'Duffy's crusade, not a single one came from Republican, Labour or even Fianna Fáil stock. They referred to the blue shirts as the assassins of Irish liberty and noted that they were going to Spain to align themselves with the would-be assassins of Spanish liberty. The Irish volunteers who went there went there because it was to, de was to defend the good name of Ireland because the Blue Shirts had mobilised and they sent 600 uh, volunteers to fight with Franco and the Irish uh, Republican anti-imperialists believed it was their duty to, to, uh, to, to try to undo what the Blue Shirts were doing and try to salvage the honourable name of, of uh, the long struggle of Irish struggle for freedom. What would have influenced uh, those of them who were, among most of them were politically conscious, was in fact the teachings of James Connolly that had been spread, first of all, by the Communist Party, but also existed in some of the publications of the Irish Transport and General Workers' Union. The very development of the, of the Republican Congress, even though it left no organisational impact on Ireland itself, did uh, generate uh, an awareness of an alternative view of society and a radical view of society which would have made those particular volunteers ideologically committed to the Spanish Republic. They weren't going for adventure. There, I think there were less uh, there were less manifest or fewer manifestations beyond a handful of any volunteer who went to Spain for non-political reasons. A lot of the cream of the, uh, the of the working class movement across Europe uh, gave their lives in the battlefields of Spain. That was a necessary sacrifice at that time. But also, you have to remember that in international, the, the brigades that went from Ireland was also people from the north of Ireland went. Was also supported by elements of unionism, Labour Party and stuff like that. It was a greater mix in the north from the south. But it did draw in those uh, radical democratic forces, which was an echo of the Republican Congress in the 1920s, the 20s and early 30s, where the Republican Congress and communists were trying to organise within the Protestant community. I mean, Congress, as I say, had difficulty publishing its newspaper. It moved offices several times. Uh, the impetus had gone by 1936. People like Michael Price and, and a lot of the Citizen Army had joined the Labour Party by that point. Um, Others had drifted back to the IRA, for example, as well. So Spain gives 
the left an issue to mobilise around. Of course, some volunteers go and give their lives, are injured or jailed in, in the course of, of fighting for the Spanish Republic. But it also gives a focus within Ireland, even though they're, they're very much going against the, the tide of public opinion, it does give the people involved around Congress um, an issue to mobilise on over the next couple of years. Standing here at Dunleary Harbour today, it's difficult to picture the huge crowds who would have gathered here to wave off Owen O'Duffy in the blue shirts, destined for what they perceived to be a defensive religion in Spain. However, the blue shirts' time in Spain was largely uneventful. They returned quickly, leading Brendan Behan to quip that they were the only army in history to return with more men than they had left with. The performance of, of O'Duffy himself was actually quite despicable because uh, he just delighted in swanning around and didn't in fact lead his own men. So when they did come back, there was actually a split in the group that came back that uh, a lot of them did not want to march behind O'Duffy because they were disgusted by his behaviour. Although those who came together in the Republican Congress did have the best of intentions and strong conviction in their own beliefs, this was ultimately a missed opportunity from the left. The fledging organisation never truly recovered from the split at that Ratmines meeting. Against the backdrop of intense anti-communist hysteria in Ireland, they did persevere in pushing forward their own arguments. While the Congress was ultimately a failure, it did lay down a serious marker for future generations of socialists and indeed Republicans in Irish society. The Republican Congress represented a unique opportunity for Republicans and indeed the broader left to challenge the fledging new Irish state and to attempt to push it in a different direction. The involvement of Ulster Protestants in significant numbers represented a unique dimension of the struggle too and one which hasn't been repeated since. However, the greatest failure of the Congress was undoubtedly that split at the meeting in Ratmines. While they agreed on their ultimate aim of transforming Irish society, they disagreed on strategy, how to get there. If there is a tragedy in the story of the Republican Congress, this is it. Though the Congress continued on, any hope of bringing about serious, meaningful change in Irish society was gone from early on. They continued to represent the interests of their class as best they could, but with weakened numbers, this was an incredibly difficult task. It should be remembered that the Republican Congress did have some notable successes, including the Tenons League. The Spanish Civil War allowed the Republican Congress to show that to them, international solidarity was not merely a slogan. They watched in horror as Owen O'Duffy and the Blue Shirts went to war in Spain, with the full backing of the church and many sections of Irish society. They were not willing to allow the Blue Shirts to be the only representatives of Ireland on the battlefields of Spain, and they were willing to take on fascism, regardless of any personal cost. It's easy to be cynical about the Republican Congress. I mean, it's easy to to argue that, you know, it, in, in real terms, it lasts about six months and, you know, it's, it's been constantly um, talked up by Republicans and by the left as this great moment. But really, you know, what can you say it achieved? But I think what the Congress does point to was there were potentials for radicals in the Ireland of the 1930s. You had a layer of people, of young men and women in the Republican movement and in the socialist movement, who did want to put forward some sort of alternative idea to the Ireland that had developed North and South, who wanted to oppose um, bigotry in Northern Ireland, who wanted to oppose the type of state that had developed in the free state, and were looking for a vehicle to do so. They were never gonna find that vehicle in, in the Labour Party. They were never going to really find that vehicle in the mainstream trade union movement. The IRA really had, you know, was, was drifting towards um, an absolute identification with militarism. So I think there was an opportunity there and the ideals of the Congress, of the idea of a Republican socialism that was based around, you know, really, um, you know, emancipation and the fact that you have young women like Corey Hughes involved, 
people discussing ideas which at the time were obviously very radical for Ireland but involved in real struggles like housing campaigns in Dublin attempting to to um, mobilize people at a rank and file level at a ground level I think that's the reason why it still is inspirational and it did fail and you know in some ways probably people you know shouldn't exaggerate its potential but at the same time it did offer in 1934 a vision which was you know is in some ways still relevant.